here. Hence. Hello everyone, this is Story Dive, back again, this time interpreting the meaning of A24's new film, The Green Knight, as well as breaking down some of the cultural references and hints I noticed, and comparing the film to the original poem that it is based on. I have to say, this is my favorite film of 2021 so far. David Lowry is really proving himself to be a creative and exciting writer-director, and for me, this is his best work so far. That being said, this film isn't for everyone, in part because it is fairly ambiguous and difficult to decipher. It's a layered film that can potentially be interpreted in a number of different ways. In this video, I will give my interpretation, but I would love to hear your interpretation in the comments below. Also, as you probably guessed, there will be spoilers in this video, so if you haven't seen The Green Knight yet, I recommend you go watch it before watching this video. Let's get started. The Green Knight is based on a 14th century epic poem written in Middle English called Sir Gawain and the Green Knight. There are several interpretations of the pronunciation of Gawain's name, and in the film they tend to go with Gawain. In this video, I'll go with Gawain. The original poem is a chivalric romance based in Arthurian legend. Chivalric romance is a form of prose that was popular in the noble courts of high medieval and early modern Europe. Often these tales focus on knight errants who must take on a quest that will test their heroic qualities and knightly honor. Sir Gawain and the Green Knight is very much in this vein. Gawain must go on a quest which tests his honor and virtue. In the poem, Gawain essentially succeeds in all of these tests save one at the very end of the story. However, in the film, it is the opposite. He fails all of the tests, except for the final test at the very end of the film. But I'll get more into that later. In the setup of both the poem and film, King Arthur and his Knights of the Round Table celebrate Christmas until they are interrupted by a mysterious Green Knight, who challenges them to a Christmas game, and among Arthur's knights, only his nephew, Sir Gawain, is brave enough to accept, although in the film he isn't yet a knight. Gawain decapitates the Green Knight with a single blow, however, this is no big deal for the knight. He simply picks up his severed head and reminds Gawain of the terms of the game. Gawain must meet the knight one year hence at the Green Chapel, where he will receive an equal blow in return. This scene in the film is intercut with shots of Gawain's mother, Morgan Le Fay, casting a spell to summon the Green Knight. In Arthurian legend, Morgan Le Fay is a sorceress or witch and former apprentice of Merlin. She often plots the downfall of her half-brother, King Arthur, however in the legends she is Gawain's aunt rather than mother. In the legends, Gawain's mother is usually said to be Morgas, Morgan Le Fay's sister. In the poem, it is eventually revealed that Morgan Le Fay is pulling the strings behind the Green Knight and his Christmas game, and the film seems to go with this as well. As Morgan Le Fay casts her spell in the film, it is clear that she and what I believe are her daughters, or perhaps her sisters from the legends, are drawing on magic from an older pagan tradition. Perhaps Celtic magic, although the prominently displayed runes used, appear to be Germanic or perhaps Anglo-Saxon. I believe this introduction of an older, pre-Christian order also plays into the Green Knight himself. A number of scholars have compared the Green Knight to the Green Man, a legendary being and symbolic figure found in a number of different cultures. The Green Man's appearance is very similar to the Green Knight in that he is often depicted with green skin and leaves, branches, or vegetation growing from his body and face. The Green Man is thought of as a vegetation deity, meaning a god that represents nature and its cycle of life, death, and rebirth. This figure is also one of the few relics of the pagan past that has found its way into European Christian churches. And likewise, the Green Knight intrudes on King Arthur on Christmas Day, a relic of an older time and older value system, pagan values which emphasized the worship of nature and the cycle of the seasons. You could say the Christmas game itself is an allegory for nature. Man reaps nature and benefits from its wealth and bounty until ultimately nature reaps man, as the Green Knight intends to do to Gawain one year hence. Later in the film, the sentiment is echoed by the Lady of the Castle. I'm paraphrasing heavily, but in this great monologue, which I don't have a clip of, she essentially says that despite all the chivalry, honor, and power built by the knights, nature will in time overtake them. Green is the color of nature as well as rot. Moving on to Gawain's quest, most of the tests he faces are not actually in the poem. However, it does make a brief mention of him facing savages that dwell in the cliffs, which is a bit like the scavengers, and the poem also mentions that giants assail Gawain from a high fell. Although it doesn't go into detail, the giants are mentioned in the poem. This journey section of the film seems to test Gawain in the five knightly virtues. 
In the poem, Gawain's coat of arms is the five-pointed star called Pentangle, a symbol which is also prominently displayed on Arthur and his knights in the film. In the poem, the five points are said to represent the five wounds of Christ on the cross, the five joys of Mary, as well as the five knightly virtues. Generosity, courtesy, chastity, fellowship, which is sometimes translated as friendship, and piety. Through the film, Gawain fails all of these. First, generosity with the scavengers, then courtesy with Winifred, then chastity with the Lord's wife, then fellowship with the Lord himself, before he at first fails at, but ultimately succeeds in piety with the Green Knight. However, I don't think it's piety in the conventional knightly sense. First, Gawain fails to be generous to the scavengers, and I believe the sequence also reveals the flaws in the romantic notion of chivalry, as the scavengers are the result of the war and destruction reaped on the land by Arthur's knights. During his encounter with Winifred, Gawain fails to be courteous when he asks her what he will get in return for helping her. The character of Winifred is based on Saint Winifred, a 7th century Welsh martyr. According to legend, Winifred was decapitated by her suitor after she chose to become a nun. A well of healing sprang up where her head fell, much like the well that Gawain dives into, and in the legend her head is ultimately returned by Saint Baino. In Norse and Germanic mythology, giants often represent chaos and the forces of nature, and I believe in The Green Knight they do as well. When one of the giants attempts to touch Gawain and he flinches, as he does later with The Green Knight, it's a sign that he hasn't yet accepted nature. During this section of the film, Gawain also picks up a traveling companion, a fox, who we later find out can talk. Celtic folklore sometimes depicts the fox as a spirit guide, however, given that this is Arthurian legend, I believe the fox is also inspired by the Arthurian questing beast. The questing beast is usually depicted as an odd hybrid animal, however, its name in French is derived from a word that refers to a small dog or fox barking, and in some Arthurian tales, it is described as a small white fox-like creature. The fox later warns Gawain of his fate if he faces the Green Knight, which in the poem is done by a human guide who leads Gawain from the Lord's castle to the Green Chapel. But the Lord does hunt a fox in the poem. In the film, the fox can be seen as representing Gawain's inner doubt, or perhaps the agenda of his mother, Morgan Le Fay. Eventually, Gawain makes his way to the castle of the Lord and Lady. In the poem, the Lord is known as Lord Bertilac or Burnlac. And although the poem dedicates quite a bit of time to this section, the film version does differ quite a bit. In the poem, Gawain receives kisses from the lady, which he then must give to the Lord as part of their exchange of winnings. However, he ultimately maintains his chastity. Not so much in the film. In the poem, the lady is accompanied by an old woman, who is later revealed to be Morgan Le Fay. This seems to be the case in the film as well, as this character wears a blindfold, like Morgan Le Fay did earlier, and at one point she even touches the face of Gawain in the same way that his mother did earlier. The character of the Lord's wife, the lady, is much more complex in the film than in the poem. She physically resembles Gawain's true love, the commoner Essel, because they're played by the same actress, however her personality is a polar opposite. The lady is revealed to be very learned in the ways of science and witchcraft, which in this time period can be perceived in a similar way. Because she often appears with the older woman, we can surmise that she is working with Gawain's mother, Morgan Le Fay, and ultimately she provides Gawain with an item that will come into play later, a magical sash or girdle, which is said to protect him against all harm. After his failure in both chastity and fellowship, when he lies to the Lord, Gawain finally makes his way to the Green Chapel and the Green Knight. The Green Knight awakes on Christmas Day, and seeing Gawain waiting for him, attempts to return the blow that he was given. Christmas Day was set in late December as an adaptation of an earlier winter solstice festival. Thus, the Green Knight, who represents nature itself and the changing of the season, attempts to return the blow that was given to him, killing Gawain as the end of a cycle, which will give way to another. However, in another failure of his chivalry, Gawain resists this. He flinches, even though the Green Knight did not flinch when the same blow was given to him. Gawain resists death. Not only does he flinch, but he wears the magical girdle which will shield him from his fate. This girdle is found in the poem as well, and is the source of Gawain's great shame. The Green Knight points out that his use of the girdle is a defiance of the terms set during the Christmas game, and thus Gawain views it as a shameful failure of his virtues. In fact, at one part of the poem, Gawain refers to the girdle as a reminder of deceit and the stains and filth of the flesh. In the film, the girdle is also soiled in a different way, and also represents a kind of shame. However, in the film, I believe the girdle more so represents Gawain's unwillingness to accept his fate, death, and thus unwillingness to accept nature. 
When Gawain fails to complete his task, he is shown a vision of his possible future without honor, which is very reminiscent of the film and book, The Last Temptation of Christ. In The Last Temptation of Christ, Christ is tempted while on the cross and shown what would happen if he chose the life of a normal man. Likewise, Gawain is shown a vision. He returns to his love Essel and they conceive a child, however he never takes off his girdle, meaning he never accepts nature and his fate. Then the vision shows Arthur's death and Gawain inherits his throne, likely for his heroic deeds against the Green Knight, in other words, lies. Gawain leaves Essel, but takes their son, treating her like a common prostitute, and marries a noble lady. The son he had with Essel is eventually killed in battle, and ultimately Gawain's empire falls to ruin. At the end of the vision, he removes his girdle and accepts his fate. And thus, as the vision ends, he is able to do so as well with the Green Knight. He has ultimately accepted death and nature, and in the sense, piety, the final virtue, as he accepts God, you could say the will of the Maker. And in doing so, he finally achieves his honor. In the final shot, the Green Knight states, Now, little knight, off with your head. And the film ends on an ambiguous note. Does he actually behead Gawain? In the film, we don't know for sure. However, in the poem, the Green Knight is revealed to be Lord Bertilak. And he does not decapitate Gawain. Because Gawain maintained his chastity, he is spared. However, Bertilak does give him a little scratch as a reminder of the girdle and his failure in virtue. Tis but a scratch. Another ambiguous element of the film is Morgan Le Fay's true intention. Although we know she orchestrated the Green Knight, it's unclear what her true motive was. She may have orchestrated a heroic tale that would eventually lead her son to the throne, but ensured he would cheat this quest by using the girdle. If this is the case, Gawain defies his mother in the end. However, this ending may have also been by Morgan Le Fay's design. She may have created the Green Knight to ensure her son became a great and noble knight by ultimately abandoning the girdle. While I do like that latter interpretation, the first one is far truer to Morgan Le Fay from Arthurian legend. Regardless, I like the ambiguous ending because it leaves it open to interpretation. I would love to know what your interpretation is. This is a very layered film that I've only seen once, so I'm sure I missed some details and I'm hoping you can fill me in on those in the comments below. If you'd like to see more breakdowns like this from this channel, be sure to give the video a like, subscribe, and hit the notification bell. If you enjoyed this video, you might also enjoy my breakdown of the best King Arthur films, not including this one because it just came out, as well as my cultural breakdowns of various anime series and movies linked on the screen. Thanks for watching and until next time.